Welcome to the Capital News. I'm your host, Alex Caritas. Today is February 13th, 2020. Thank you so much for joining me. Title of today's podcast is There Is No Inflation. Well, that can't be right. We'll talk about that. Handful of things we're going to discuss. Obviously, market performance we're going to get to. Coronavirus updates. Very timely, again, with our discussion on last night's podcast as to those numbers being fudged. Well, there was a huge correction within those numbers. We're going to talk about that and the implications and consequences of what that might mean moving forward here over the first quarter and maybe perhaps beyond the first quarter of 2020. We have some political news with a little back and forth between the Justice Department and President Trump with... Attorney General Bill Barr coming out with an interview, making some statements that uh, Donald Trump probably was not too appreciative of, or is this something that was coordinated between the president and Attorney General Bill Barr? We'll discuss that as well. Also on the political front, a little bit of a Twitter feud between President Trump and Mayor Michael Bloomberg. So a battle of the billionaires taking to Twitter. This is no surprise, so I'm going to provide a little bit of commentary and analysis on that. But first, to the market performance, you know, the futures were trading down overnight. And the reason that they were in the red was because of the coronavirus update. Because you're starting to get an advanced team from the World Health Organization in China. Now, they are now on the ground. Not like it's not like an army of people, but there are World Health Organization professionals on the ground. The advanced team is what they're called, basically. And lo and behold, lo and behold, the numbers, the cases of people suffering from the coronavirus skyrocketed. They skyrocketed. There's now over 60,000 confirmed cases in China alone, and there continues to be increased cases around the world. Not at that breakneck speed that we're still seeing in China, and hopefully we don't see that same type of growth, but it could happen, and that's always something that you have to be on the lookout for. We know not to trust the Chinese. We know not to trust the Chinese Communist Party more specifically. We discussed yesterday the analysis of an individual out there who I've been focusing on, in regards to the calculus that the Chinese Communist Party is playing. And I believe that to be true between, well, we have a couple risks here. We can try to contain this thing to the best of our ability, and that might mean really shutting down the entire country, which is going to have knock-on effects, economically speaking, as well. Well, China is the second largest economy in the world. Can they really survive? Can they risk shutting down the country for an extended period of time. Supply chains are going to change. People, countries, companies are going to want out of China. They're going to want to move somewhere else. Now, you can't do this at the drop of a hat. I mean, how many millions, if not billions of dollars have been invested by foreign corporations into China? You're not just going to drop it like it's nothing. My understanding by listening to a recent analysis from a law firm that pretty much specializes in helping firms set up supply chains around the world is it would take about 12 to 18 months, 12 to 18 months. Say you have a factory in China and you want to move somewhere else. It's going to take about 12 to 18 months for that to happen. So this is not going to be something that takes place very quickly. Now, obviously, that's an average. Some things might go a little bit quicker. Some things might take a little bit longer. It's a big business decision. You have to build relationships. You have to understand the government and all of those respective countries that you might be considering to, to set up shop or to, to partner with somebody who's going to be a part of your supply chain. What are the laws? What are the regulations? How's the workforce? What's the skill of that workforce? Can they keep up? What's going on? There's a lot of questions to ask. A lot of things to ponder, a lot of relationships to build. So it takes time. But China, the Chinese Communist Party, they have to weigh this. Do we say, okay, well, we kind of put it on the back burner. We say it's kind of safe to go out there and, okay, we can open up factories at 25% capacity or 50% capacity, and then we'll see what happens from there. 
because we cannot shut this thing down indefinitely, right? We can't keep this shut down for two months, three months, four months, because then, you know, the horse is out of the barn, the cat's out of the bag. This is, I mean, by that time, we're going to have a lot more serious things to consider. Because if China has to remain on lockdown for another month, another two months, it's a pandemic. It's a pandemic. And that's not going to be good, obviously, for anybody. The, the economics of it is going to be the least of people's concerns at that time. I mean, you're going to see sell-offs here. You're going to see sell-offs everywhere. But, I mean, now it becomes a matter of survival. Life and death literally hangs in the balance. That's going to take top priority. But there will obviously be financial and economic damage and political damage as well. And that's another thing that the Chinese Communist Party has to balance in the midst of all of this. Because if it comes out that this is a lot worse than what we're being told and that the Chinese Communist Party knew this, you're going to have 1.4 billion people who are extremely, who are going to be extremely agitated and pissed off at their government for saying, you know, you should have had this under control. You should have informed us of what was really going on, but you didn't. I mean, they're walking on eggshells as it is. So they got to juggle all of these balls up in the air at the same time. How's it all going to play out? We hope that the Chinese, that the World Health Organization and other health organizations around the world and health professionals can contain this thing and it dies off quickly. Okay, time will tell. We have the president of the United States saying, well, you know, maybe, maybe when we get to warmer months, the heat, the heat will kill the virus. There is some truth in that being a possibility. However, uh, you know, you, this thing is still spreading in Singapore. In Singapore, it ain't snowing there if you get my drift. So to say that we're just going to wait and miraculously the heat is going to kill this virus, I don't think that's going to be the case if this thing exists and it is persisting and growing in Singapore. So stay tuned. But the futures were trading in the negative overnight off of this news that the coronavirus, the numbers were a lot worse than anticipated. And what was being reported, no surprise to us here, shouldn't be a surprise to anybody with two brain cells to rub together. You know, in the markets, they ended up closing in the red for the day. But boy, did they make a rally, and boy, did they end up in the black throughout the day. I mean, you think this is just going to be a down day. It makes sense. You got a bad headline. This thing has been rallying. Okay, there's just taking some heat off of this thing. Okay, let's cool our heels. Ba -ba 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 -ba. Oh, no. Oh, no. It's got to rally. It's got to make a move to the upside. The Federal Reserve, of course, has to get involved in the overnight markets. We're going to talk about that a little bit more, a little bit more detail with that. And so they make it up into the black, but they did close down for the day. The Dow Jones Industrial Average closed down 128 points, down four-tenths of 1%. The S&P 500 gave back six points, down about uh, two-tenths of 1%. The NASDAQ 100 gave back 17, also down about two-tenths of 1% as well. In the commodity space, we continue to see a little bit of a bid in the oil space, uh, probably on the anticipation of OPEC cuts. Again, folks, this is not going to do it. They are really, really going to have to make some significant cuts if they want to have the price of oil increase and for that price increase to be sustained over a period of time. We have seen massive geopolitical risks over the course of the past couple of months already. I mean, it's, only, it's still only February. And oil, yes, it spiked, and then it came right back down pretty much as quickly as it went up. Why? Because the world is awash in oil and natural gas. And what compounds the problem from a pricing perspective is that the global demand is slowing down. Now you have this coronavirus slowdown. It's just compounding the things. It's just exacerbating all of these issues. No surprise here to this audience, at least it shouldn't be because we've been talking about this for a long time. Nonetheless, we do have WTI trading at $51.50 a barrel. Brent, the international metric, is at $56 and a quarter per barrel. Natural gas, $1.81 per million British thermal units. Precious metals, we have gold at $1,576 an ounce, holding steady. We also have silver at $17.64 an ounce. Uncle Sam's 10-year treasury... Note, hanging on, 1.61%. But there are a lot of macro strategists out there who look at the macro global picture of things, thinking that the interest rates are going to be heading south. 
We don't disagree with that. In fact, we agree with that assessment. Interest rates are very much likely headed lower, especially if central banks can maintain somewhat of a foothold on the markets, which over the near term, they probably will. We're also likely to continue seeing some sort of flight to safety, perhaps come back into the markets if, if it is shown that the coronavirus is much worse than what has been anticipated. And, you know, the Chinese Communist Party has just been keeping the numbers artificially low for reasons we explained previously. And uh, they're just going to continue to do it uh, to the best of their ability, to the best of their ability. If they start allowing Western media over there or Western health organizations in there, they're not going to be able to cover up everything because in this shuffle, they fired a couple of their top politicians when it came to a handful of uh, provinces within China. So it's sort of a changing of the guard. We're in control now. We got the bad guys out. They were the ones suppressing the numbers, of course. You know, you always got to have a, a fall guy. Somebody's got to get thrown under the bus. Always happens, folks. It doesn't just happen here. It doesn't just happen in communist regimes. It happens everywhere. That's politics. It's seemingly human nature. Why we can't tell each other the truth is beyond me, but that's what we do. So this is going to persist for quite a while, I do imagine. And uh, we're just gonna have to, we're just gonna see what happens. But the stock market, uh, net net, just wants to continue to grind higher. An interesting chart I came across uh, on my Twitter feed this afternoon was somebody posting uh, the stock performance of Microsoft during the dot com era, and the stock performance of Microsoft over the most recent handful of years. And it is eerily, <laughs> eerily tracking the same type of growth pattern, which at this juncture, at this juncture in the year 2000 is when Microsoft started to top off, started to top out. That was it. It hit its peak and it was downhill from there. Well, that's where we are right now. If this thing continues, if Microsoft continues to track itself 20 years ago, it's basically topping out right now. Now, you didn't have the Federal Reserve doing what it's doing. You didn't have a president at the time screaming at the top of his lungs, obsessed with the performance of the stock market. So can this thing continue? Of course it can. Of course it can. But what is interesting to note, when it comes to at least the Federal Reserve's involvement in the overnight repo market, they are starting, they are starting to pull back ever so slightly. A few billion here, five billion there. They're starting to lower the caps. They're starting to take less money in, so or less collateral in, I should say. So it's going to be very interesting to see what happens over the coming weeks if this is going to have a material effect on the stock market. Now, we would imagine that it would because the correlation is so strong. I mean, in all honesty, folks, it's basically causation. It's not correlation, it's causation. Because when we rattle off all of the economic data, it, it's not good. So how can stocks continue to rally to the degree at which they have, at the rate in which they're doing, on such poor economic data that pours out? Now, of course, everybody, again, who wants to point to Donald Trump, well, we're at 50-year lows on the uh, unemployment rate, more people are working than ever before, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, so what? So what? I told you those same statistics could have been rallied off under the Obama administration for all intents and purposes. Now, not the unemployment being a 50-year low, obviously, but ah, more Americans are working today than ever before. A previous president could have said that. The previous one could have said that before him, too. You know why? Because the population of the country is growing. Again, you have to look at the participation rate. And we talked about that over the course of this week. We talked about it yesterday where, you know, it seems like an older cohort of Americans are coming out of retirement back into the workforce. Now, it's good that they have the opportunity to do so and find a job, but if the economy was so strong and these individuals were so well prepared for their retirement years, then why are they coming out to work is my question. So obviously, the consumer, the economy is not as strong as we are led to believe by the President of the United States. No surprise to this audience. We have real not nominal, but real. So we're taking into consideration inflation. Real average weekly wages on a year-over-year -year basis have just hit zero, zero percent. So strip out inflation, no wage growth on a year-over-year -year basis. We also have record high delinquencies, record high delinquencies in the auto market. 
auto loans. Wow, you know, we were talking about this last year and it, the trend just continues. Well, surprise, surprise. When you're letting people take a loan to buy a car for seven years, eight years, I've even seen some nine-year loans being pushed out there, or at least discussed, I should say. At least discussed. I mean, are you kidding me? People have no idea what that means. I mean, it is going, they're going to be underwater. You're going to have negative equity. The thing depreciates as soon as you drive it off the lot. I mean, we're basically, what we're doing is sacrificing our personal financial balance sheet for the sake of the auto sector's balance sheet. That's not how it's supposed to work, folks. It's not how it's supposed to work at all. What should happen in a free market system, ideally, would be that the price of these cars and trucks and SUVs and everything would start coming down. Because if the consumer can't afford them, because clearly they can, if they have to take out a seven, eight year loan to quote unquote afford the payment, remember, I, I, it gets me going. You, oh, I can afford the payment, therefore I can afford the asset. No, that's not how it works. That's not how it works. You have to look at the total price. You have to understand what you're doing. And most people in this country, unfortunately, don't have the financial acumen to understand what's going on. But if you're buying a car, you should not be taking out a loan for seven or eight years. If you can't buy the car with a loan of three, maybe even four years, four years, I'll give you four, then you can't afford it. Okay? Just rule of thumb. Get something else. Get from point A to point B. You don't have to look the good. Okay? You don't have to worry about what other people think of you. You don't have to keep up with the Joneses because the Joneses can't keep up with themselves. Believe me when I tell you. All right? Because that was another report that just came out. Uh, it was either yesterday or today. About a third of Americans, about a third of Americans, obviously, and we know this, do not have money in between paychecks. Again, it's paycheck to paycheck. And some of these people make six figures. Some of these people make six figures and they don't have any money in the bank. They're still living basically paycheck to paycheck. It's terrible. You can't make this stuff up. But somehow, this is the greatest economy in the world. But back to the autos. Back to the autos. Record high delinquencies. This is above where we, and well above where we were at the height of the financial crisis a decade ago. But, you know, if you listen to the president, if you listen to Jamie Dimon, if you listen to all the other idiot bankers on Wall Street, oh, the consumer is strong. Of course, Jamie Dimon doesn't want to tell you that J.P. Morgan is laying people off in their consumer division. How can that be? If it's so strong, if everybody's just looking for money and the consumer is so vibrant, then why are you laying people off, Jamie? It doesn't make any sense. Oh, I know. Maybe it's because people are living paycheck to paycheck and using their credit cards. Ah, oh, that's it. They're using their credit cards to make ends meet. And you're charging them what? 15, 20, 25%? Oh, fantastic. Of course the consumer is strong when you're, when you're grinding them like that for everything they got. Basically turning this country into debt slaves. That's all it is. That's all it is. Debt slaves and the financialization of the country with the addicts on Wall Street turning the stock market into a casino. I mean, it was bad before a decade ago with all of the derivatives and the derivatives on top of the derivatives and everything that goes down there. We've talked about that before. Now, it's just it's the stock market itself. It's the whole damn system. Everything. Everything has been turned into some sort of asset, some sort of casino chip. There is no soul. There is no heart and soul in this country anymore. Everything's about profit and money. It's, it's all materialistic. It's all materialistic. And this is, this is sort of the pride before the fall type of situation. I'm telling you, folks, this is serious. It's not good for society. The wealth inequality that exists mainly because of the Federal Reserve and Central Bank policy of flooding the system with liquidity over the past decade, what this is going to do with inflation. Of course, again, there is no inflation, right? Then why do we have people around the world protesting when the price of gas goes up just a little bit or their country has to raise the fee to get on a bus or to take the metro? People are like, oh, hell no, this is it. I'm done. Another nickel, another quarter, another 50 cents. That's it. That's it. Enough is enough. And now they're demanding change. That's inflation, folks. That's the cost of living. People are sick and tired of being sick and tired. And of course, there's no inflation here in the United States. Oh, no, never. Oh, here's the headline for you. U.S. inflation rate highest 
since 2018. Annual inflation rate in the U.S. climbed to 2.5% in January from 2.3% in December and beating market forecasts of 2.4%. It is the highest inflation since October of 2018, mainly supported by a 12.8% jump in gasoline cost. Core inflation remained at 2.3% for the fourth consecutive month. Give me a break. Give me a break. It held steady 2.3% for four months. Get out of here. The monthly rate fell to 0.1% from 0.2% and below forecasts of 0.2% as shelter costs grew quicker and gasoline prices declined. Yet in the previous sentence, they tell us that gasoline costs jumped 12.8%. But here, oh, no, no, no. Shelter costs grew quicker and gasoline prices declined. Yeah. Yeah. Can't even make heads or tails of what's going on, except the fact that inflation is going up. And 2.5% doesn't do it justice. And anybody with two brain cells out there to rub together knows that it's much, much worse than that. And how much higher will it go? How, what will, how much will it be, quote unquote, tolerated by the Federal Reserve? Because remember, they're, they're going to allow it to be symmetrical. Symmetrical, because the target's 2%, which makes absolutely no sense. They're just pulling this number out of their you-know-where. They're just making it up. Ah, 2% seems reasonable. It's not really going to hurt you too badly. But 2%. But they couldn't even get it at 2%. Officially. With the government statistics. Officially, you couldn't get there at 2%. Well, since we were below 2% for so long, we can tolerate being above 2%. Well, for how long? How much damage do you want to do to the American people? Because Jay Powell, the chairman of the Federal Reserve, he kicks, kicks off basically all of his press conferences following a Federal Open Market Committee meeting with, we work for the American people. And my question remains, what people? Which Americans? Which ones? Because it's not those heading into retirement. It's not those in retirement. It's not... The millennial generation and those coming after because you're stealing their future with the actions that you're taking. And so is the federal government. And so are states government. It's all debt. It's all it is. And this audience should understand well what debt is by now. It's future consumption. It's future production brought forward to today. It's theft. It's immoral, especially to the degree at which we're doing here. Trillion dollar deficits. Not a Republican cares. Not a Republican cares. Trade wars. No Republican cares. Bailouts. Farm bailouts. No Republican cares. Nah, we don't care. No big deal. Federal Reserve running rampant. Nah, we don't care. Negative interest rates. No fiscal conservatives. No, nah, no, no, nothing. Not a peep. Nothing. Can't make this stuff up, folks. Also on the economic front, we are going to have some big numbers coming out of the Eurozone. Germany is expected to report GDP growth on a quarter-over-quarter quarter basis and a year-over-year year basis. Anticipation is that they will have entered a uh, recession or most likely will be heading into a recession. I believe they're pretty much already in one. Uh, again, the technical definition of recession is two consecutive quarters of negative GDP growth. Now, again, that's the technical definition. There's a whole host of other data points that one would look at to make the determination, really, if a country is in recession. There's no question that Germany is most definitely headed into recession. And the longer that the coronavirus and any other type of slowdown that takes place in Asia, particularly in China, continues, the worse off Germany will be because they are such a large trading partner. And likewise, the dominoes will start to cascade down throughout the rest of the Eurozone. And the European economy, for that matter, the U.S. economy, everywhere. You understand the interconnectedness here. We're also going to have the Euro area GDP growth rate on a quarter-over-quarter quarter basis and a year-over-year year basis. So that'll make some headlines, I imagine, tomorrow morning. To some of the political noise, we have Attorney General Bill Barr out there saying it's impossible... It's impossible for me to do my job with the president tweeting like he does. And again, this is talking about the Roger Stone debacle, whatever you want to call it, that has been sort of consuming the airwaves over the past couple of days in regards to the president saying that the 
prosecutor's recommendation of a sentence of seven to nine years was ridiculous. Uh, How dare they do such a thing? And then you have the higher ups within the Justice Department uh, getting involved and and basically telling the judge, no, 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 we didn't mean to send that. Uh, Seven to nine years is is unusual. It's, it's, It's too abusive. It's not right. And then you had some resignations of those prosecutors who were on the case. And then everything sort of started to spill over afterwards. You still have the judge who makes the final decision. You know, you're going to have the prosecutors making the recommendation. It's public. It's not secret. It's not sealed. It's not behind closed doors. It's public. Seven to nine years, the judge gets to have her final say-so. She can say, yeah, I think that's reasonable given the conduct of Roger Stone, his past, what took place during trial, the facts of the case, yada, yada, yada. Well, he's an older gentleman. What's his health like? Maybe, you know, seven to nine years is too much. What are some of the other precedent? Maybe he should only be in there for two to three years, four years, whatever. She'll have the final say. So again, this is a lot of noise. It's a lot of hype, especially coming from the left because they're saying, told you so, told you so, told you so. And I even said here too, told you so, be on the lookout for this type of thing. Either one, that the president was actually going to start getting involved more heavily and actually go after some of his quote unquote enemies list. Or at least the media would start playing it as if the president was doing that. So again, even if some of these people, if the president and the Justice Department have some of these people dead to rights, half the country's not going to believe it because they're going to say, look, he feels vindicated. He feels exonerated. He gave that speech, that tirade, whatever it was in the East Room of the White House two days after his uh, acquittal. You know, what? Uh, well, uh, he's doing it, folks. He's doing it. That's going to be the outrage on the mainstream media, and we're already starting to see it. He's weaponized the Justice Department and the FBI to go after his enemies list. And half the country will believe it. Maybe more than half the country. Why? Because the credibility of this president is virtually shot. It's virtually virtually shot if you're paying attention. It's virtually shot. And that's a tragedy. So now, there's other speculation out there, even in some of the media, but I've been following as to whether or not this statement by Bill Barr was coordinated with the White House and with President Trump, or at least with the White House. Because most of the time, you know, we have a few years of history of this. If a member of the administration, especially if they're a current member of the administration, speaks ill of the president, or of his actions, or of his Twitter habits, what have you. They're not in the picture for much longer. But President Trump seemingly likes Bill Barr. They seem to get along well. Bill Barr sort of gives the impression to me that he's sort of at the stage of his life, his career, where he really doesn't give a damn, and he's not going to really care what other people think about him and what he says, and even maybe what he does, within limits, of course. So was this coordinated? And the reason why it could have been coordinated is to get the media to jump on this story 24-7, or at least 24 hours today, maybe 24-2, 24-3. We'll see how long this thing plays out. Because you got to give President Trump credit. He's great at throwing little pieces out there for the media to nibble on and to bite on and to get obsessed with. Trump derangement syndrome, what have you. He's very good at it. He knows how to manipulate the media. He's been doing it for a long time. Probably one of the reasons he's the president of the United States. Got all that free airtime during his campaign. So time will tell, time will tell if this was some sort of coordinated effort between the White House and Attorney General Bill Barr of him coming out and saying it's it's impossible for me, for me to do my job as Attorney General so long as the president continues to tweet in the manner in which he does. It also could have been Bill Barr sort of sticking up for the institution of the Justice Department and the FBI to say, look, I'm my own man. I'm my own person. I'm not a little minion of Donald Trump's. I'm not afraid to give an interview and to speak my mind on public television. It could have been a little bit of both. But nonetheless, the president has to sort of check himself. He really does. He really does. Because I do think one of the statements or another tweet that came out from Press Secretary Stephanie Grisham was something on the lines of, well, the president... Uh, you know, understands this, that, and the other, but uh, he's an American citizen. He has the right to speak up on these issues as he sees fit. Okay. All right. That might be true. Net, net, 
that might be true. But you have to understand when you're the president of the United States, your words and your actions carry a lot more weight than your typical average citizen. I mean, I could scream at the top of my lungs. I'm not going to move the markets. I'm not going to move them a hair. Donald Trump can come out, tweet something on Twitter, and the markets, you can have billions of dollars gained or lost in a matter of minutes. Seconds sometimes, depending on what was said. That's power, ladies and gentlemen. And he knows he has it. And he continues to use it to manipulate the markets and do a whole host of other things that he should not be doing as the president of the United States. He just should not be doing it. That's a very dangerous precedent. Whatever you might think of this president, what, do you, what about the next guy that comes in? Oh, well, he got away with doing X, Y, Z. Let me do it. Why can't I get away with it? That's the problem. It's not just the here and now. It's the future. So time will tell as to whether or not that was a coordinated effort between Trump, the White House, and Bill Barr. Because if Bill Barr is gone in the near future, well, then you know that <laughs> Donnie Boy didn't like it. You also have a little bit of a battle of the billionaires taking to Twitter. Between President Trump and Mayor Michael Bloomberg, Donald Trump coming out calling uh, Bloomberg uh, Mini Mike or whatever he's calling him so far, standing at five foot four is basically a ball of low energy. So sort of trying to peg him, sort of how he did uh, Jeb Bush, low energy Jeb, a few years ago, which worked extremely well and basically just derailed Jeb Bush's campaign. Not that I think the country really wanted another Bush in the office. Uh, so quickly, uh, and rightly so. I mean, it was just too much status quo. Got to go, basically, is what it was. Donald Trump is very good at naming people like that, and typically it sticks. Uh, in 2015, you know, most of those candidates didn't think that it was going to stick. They thought Donald Trump was just doing this as a publicity stunt. He was never going to gain traction. They pretty much shrugged it off. Well, we know better. We have a few years of learning, and now he's going up against Michael Bloomberg, who is a media company. Bloomberg. Bloomberg Media. Okay, so now you have basically two media juggernauts going at it. And Bloomberg now knows not to back down, get involved, understands publicity. Basically, there's no such thing as bad publicity. So if he's got to go get in the muck, get a little bit dirty here with Donald Trump on a Twitter battle, he's going to do it. He's going to do it. And it's smart to a degree. Now, it doesn't mean he has to get nasty. He could hit him with facts and to those types of things and ask questions. He could retweet Donald Trump's tweet years ago when he was criticizing Barack Obama on certain numbers and then say, Mr. President, it's the same number we have today. If it was terrible five years ago, why isn't it terrible today? If it was terrible five years ago, how can it be the greatest economy ever now? Okay, I mean, you could hit him all day on that. So you don't even have to get dirty with Donald Trump. But it appears that... To at least to some degree so far, Bloomberg is not afraid to get dirty with the president. And again, there's no such thing as bad publicity is basically what the Bloomberg strategy appears to be at this time. And it's smart because we've had a, the Iowa caucus. We had the New Hampshire primary. The, the Democratic candidates are starting to whittle down. Bloomberg's name keeps getting thrown out there, getting thrown out there. The name recognition, now he's mixing it up with Donald Trump on Twitter. Now, again, folks, net net, what if Bloomberg gets it and say Bloomberg wins, what's going to be the big difference at the end of the day? Is he going to abolish the Federal Reserve? Is he going to abolish the federal income tax? Is he going to continue to prime the press so the military industrial complex can make out like bandits? Is he going to continue to pump the press so that Wall Street can continue to make out like bandits? I mean, unless those things are head on addressed, then the answer is yes. The swamp is going to continue. The swamp is going to continue. Is it, but, you know, maybe we'll have a calmer hand in the White House. Maybe we'll be somebody with less divisive rhetoric. Maybe somebody who can actually bring the nation together to a better degree. That would be big. But, you know, it really doesn't take away from those core issues that have caused so much of the political and societal problems that we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis and the things that we talk about here. Again, going to the root of what the Federal Reserve does and the negative effects of taxation, especially to the degree in which Americans are taxed. But this thing's going to heat up. I think it's smart for Bloomberg to get somewhat, uh, again, in these battles with Trump because it's name recognition. If you're hearing the name, then you're involved with it. Why the rest of the Democratic field didn't go after Trump on Twitter, just take him on head on, is beyond me. Because the media eats this stuff up. 
you could have gotten free media. That's what I'm saying, how stupid these Democrats are. It's, it's beyond me. They could hit them. They could hit the president every single day on the facts, on the truth. The economic numbers that we talk about here all the time, they could hit them every single day. Mr. President, this is the best. Two hours later, another statistic. Mr. President, this is the greatest ever. I don't think so. You could hit them all day. And not a one of them is doing it. The only person who, again, I think will is going to be Michael Bloomberg because he has a team who understands the data. It's Bloomberg Media. It's Bloomberg Data. That's what he does. That's why he is one of the wealthiest individuals in the world. He knows media. He knows data. And again, I give credit to President Trump and his team and b before when he was a candidate because they understand the media and they understand data. So this is if it's a matchup between those two, it'll be a very good matchup. But then, of course, you still have Bernie Sanders in there. What's his traction going to be over the coming months? Joe Biden, I think he's pretty much gone. He, he, I, don't, I just don't think he's going to be able to make it. I don't. That doesn't bother me. I'm not a big fan of Joe Biden. He's been here long enough. He's done enough. Go back to Delaware. Enjoy your grandkids. Whatever you want to do and take a nap. Please. You've done enough. So that's it, folks. A mix of economics, a mix of politics as usual. But remember, there is no inflation. There is no inflation. So you have nothing to worry about. Stay diversified, stay vigilant, and stay with the Capital News. I am your host, Alex Kreitis. Godspeed.